The world can seem fast-paced and out of control. At the Saddleback College Emeritus Institute, we go at your learning pace, offering a variety of tuition-free and mentally stimulating classes. Explore several academically rigorous courses that will enrich your body and mind. It's never too late to try something new. Apply on our website or by visiting our Clubhouse 4 office or at the Saddleback Campus. The Saddleback College Emeritus Institute, your first choice for lifelong learning in South Orange County. Well, with us right now from the Saddleback College Emeritus Institute, we have an instructor that is back with us for a second time, Eva Marie Rodriguez Morris. Good Hi, to good see morning. you. Good morning. Thank you. And you uh, teach art history. Yes. Right? Yes, I do. I do. And I remember last time you were on, we were. Um, kind of going over uh, you know the the importance of art history and you can take it back hundreds of years you can take yes. it back 25 or 30 years right absolutely absolutely um, art history <clears throat> what I love about it it's a wonderful blend of the visual with history exactly and and it's wonderful to look at works of art and learn of how societies lived learn of politics mm -hmm. um, hundreds and hundreds of years ago you know with, through images and such and it creates a wonderful platform for some really good discussions it does and you can I, I guess look at it from different angles meaning one looking at something at, at pieces from a certain time frame and look at it as what was going on in the world then Absolutely. also what was going on artistically mm -hmm. in the world the Renaissance period or how how is art why is art changing at this point in time and how is it reflecting the times as well, right? Right. It's, it's very fascinating when you can look at it as a whole mm -hmm. and you see how the society is impacting what artists are doing. Yeah. A, a great <clears throat> example is we have the Reformation, which is a split between the church. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then we have, so we have Reformation art supporting that split. Then we have counter-reformation art, which is what the, the Catholic <coughs> Church did to, mm -hmm. to reassert their authority. So then we have that kind of art. So definitely that's a period <laughs> of time where it was back and forth, back and forth, yeah. um, but where the politics definitely took a big play in what our, the artists were doing at that time. Do you look in your course that you do here a certain time period, or do you because obviously you can't look at everything. Do you ever j go back uh, just 50 years from now or do you stick to going back 500 years from now? Well, it really depends <clears throat> upon the class. Okay. The, this is my uh, first class here at Laguna Woods and I had so much fun with my students. And so what I chose to do is a later part of Europe, uh, Western European history, Okay. meaning we started at the Gothic period, mm -hmm. and then hopefully we're going to end right um, at the Baroque period. So we've been going on this progression to kind of give them an overview. I like to tell my students it's like we're at the airport, we're landing the plane, but we can't get off the plane, but we're there in the city, mm -hmm. and then we're going to take off again into a new part. And then once I have laid that, that foundation, uh, and if I continue to teach here at Laguna Woods, which I'm hoping, um, that then we can start focusing on some uh, more topical uh, subjects. Right. Such as looking at individual artists from a certain time, maybe comparing contrast artists from two different times and such. Do you have a certain time frame that you really like? Is it the one you're you're looking at now? What what are those years between the Mer the Gothic period and the Baroque period? I would say about the 10th century okay. all the way up into the mm, 18th century. Oh wow! Yes, so we're just, we're covering <coughs> a wide range of uh, years. My favorite. Actually, that's one thing I love about teaching is that my specialty is medieval studies in architecture. Mm -hmm. However, by teaching and by uh, creating these learning experiences in my classroom, I found out that I just love it all. I mean, there really isn't one favorite yeah. per se because it's all wonderful when you learn about the artists, you appreciate their work, you learn about the history of why the work was made. Mm -hmm. And those are things that I try to bring into my classroom. Do you go over during that time frame as well uh, where, you know, any particular artists, either where, where they lived and why they chose this? Oh, because it's, you know, you may have artists that are, you know, several years apart, 
uh, or very close to each other, even the, in the same decade or two, and yet totally sure. different depending on what their experiences were. Oh, absolutely. And that's what I, I love doing <clears throat> research on is learning the person behind the painting or the mm -hmm. sculpture or even the architecture, you know, the building or the structure. Right. Uh, learning a little more about their life. What was their motivation? What got them started? What was their training? Uh, an example is I was able to show a brief documentary on Rembrandt's workshop where you actually see where he painted his works and his masterpieces. Oh, interesting. And I'm hoping that gives uh, my students an appreciation, uh, I'm sure it does, but just an insight to, to his mindset when he was creating some of his masterpieces that he has done. And many of the artists really did, for the time period uh, of, of uh, starting probably, you know, back then when they were very young and, you know, I guess uh, middle age back then was probably in your 30s or something. <laughs> but their styles sometimes drastically change depending on their influence and how their life changed, right? Correct. And what's fascinating is that I always like to remind my students, for example, of this whole workshop mm -hmm. uh, structure <clears throat> where boys were leaving their families as early as eight and nine years old to go wow. work in workshops for some of these artists. Mm -hmm. And then you work your way up to become an apprentice. And then when you finally get to become a master, then you're allowed to go and open your own workshop. So in a way, it was wow. this unique system that doesn't get talked a lot uh, um, much, where it, in my opinion, they were able to control the quality mm -hmm. um, of, of artists who went through this process. Uh, most of the artists that we have today are considered masters, of course, mm -hmm. in the respective time periods, and so therefore they already had that uh, pedigree of artistic, right. um, I guess, essence in their family, mm -hmm. coming from either goldsmiths, um, some of them were um, sculptors in their own right, and then showed some promise so the family would send them to workshops. Right, so it's... It it, there was really like a hierarchy back then, would you say, as far as, could, could somebody in that time frame just say, I want to be an artist, but I don't want to study an, under anyone, I just want to go off and do it myself. It would have been difficult. Um, that would be a subject I would love to research uh, because I do love doing research. <coughs> but that would have been difficult, mainly um, because also, especially in Europe, you have the emergence of guilds mm -hmm. and, and they were very powerful. Okay. You know, oh, they were? In, okay. in their own rights and, and guilds for everything. Sword maker guilds and shield guilds and gold guilds and tapestry oh, guilds. Oh, that's interesting. And I so, didn't realize that. Yeah, so there's all these other elements that go behind even just looking at a painting. You know, when you look at the whys and the hows. Yeah, where unlike today, anyone can be an artist. Yes. I mean, if you get somewhat of a following and you go down to the local art shows. Oh, or absolutely, yes. And if you got the wherewithal and maybe the backing, you can open up a studio and there you are. <laughs> well, yeah. and one thing that I think it is great for artists is that there are more platforms for right. people to share their works, much different than and, and the very few that were allowed or artists were able to really show works. Yeah, Let me ask you, ago. Uh, but even back then, did they do reproductions? In other words, you know, the master would create their, their, their piece. Would they have some of the apprentices kind of make copies of it so they could be sold? Or was it usually just that one painting and that was it? it it's interesting that you mentioned this because there were two types of copying, I guess, lack of a better word. Right. Um, some artists were very entrepreneurial, and so they would create several images of a certain, um, a popular one would have been a religious image, so mm -hmm. they would have private devotional items that they would sell um, okay. to people. And but small items about this big or yeah. so big. But what's fascinating is that other artists, for example, um, after the Renaissance, would travel to Rome and we have their drawings of some of the masterpieces by mm -hmm. Michelangelo, right. by Raphael, when they would go visit the Vatican because they knew that they were the masters, they already knew who they were, right. and they, would, they knew the importance of seeing their work in person. Um, kind of much like today how I like taking my <coughs> students and I, all the art professors do to local museums because it is important to see the actual work right. uh, of these masters in yeah, person. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, yes. So they did have a way of 
uh, of being a business as well as just yes. being an artist. Right, as well as just creating or just uh, having these great commissions that they would get either mm -hmm. from you know, the Vatican or rich patrons, right. such as like the Medici family or the Sforzi family in Florence, that uh, there was a level of artists who would, would uh, um, you know, paint smaller images. Um, once the printing press and engravings right. were done, then people would uh, buy those. Rembrandt had mm -hmm. a lot of his drawings and etchings, for example, um, that he would sell. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned commission work. Back then, were these artists solely commissioned, or did they do things for themselves, create pieces on their own, hoping to sell them, or just you know, just for their their own, um, really their own gratification. I believe it was mostly commissions. Okay. Because that's how they would make their living. Yeah. We do see a big change in that when we hit probably the mid uh, 19th century. Okay. So once we're starting to venture into uh, the Impressionist period, mm -hmm. and of course that starts with their exhibition that they had in 1874, that we see the artists kind of have this approach where I need to sell because I'm a businessman. Right. But artists were doing that prior to, yeah. just um, on, on more of a grand scale, but now it's coming, some people even refer to like street art, something right. that you know a person off the street could come in and purchase. Exactly. Now, I want to um, mention to folks that coming up, there's going to be a fine art show at the Learning Resource Center at Saddleback College, and meet the artist's reception on Friday, March 31st at 2 o'clock. Now, how long does this um, art show go on for? Is it just that day, or does it go on for a couple of weeks? No, this is an ongoing show, Okay. and so we would encourage everyone to come to campus okay. and, and visit the, the art exhibition, and it's going to be going ongoing until, I believe, early May. Okay, that's great. Yes. And is it student art? Um, yes, it's student art. Oh, fantastic. Yes. So it's wonderful. You can come and see what your peers have been doing, and then come in to take my class and learn a little bit more. <laughs> All right, that sounds like a lot of fun. Excellent. And you're teaching summer as well? Yes, I'll be okay. here at, um, at the Clubhouse 4 teaching uh, Mondays and Friday mornings, and we're going to be focusing on architecture and the Fantastic. role it has. And I want to tell people that registration starts uh, in about, a, well, not less than a month, actually. Mm -hmm. April 21st, that's where registration begins for your emeritus classes for the summer season, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Lots of fun. Yeah. Well, I hope to see you back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. For yeah, always me. good to see you. Likewise. You take care. Thank you. And we'll be right back.